So with this video, I start to round off the last part of the, this module, module three, which uh, contains the primary theoretical contributions of the cooperative economy towards a stakeholder-led democracy. And in this uh, set of videos that derive actually from chapter eight of that uh, book, I uh, appeal for an ecology uh, framework as opposed to one of national accounts for framing macroeconomic um, transactions. And I think this is a suitable framework as it uh, does not require us to microfound and it is a framework that is embedded within structures of interaction and interdependence. And of course, ecology is a science, a discipline that arose in the 1970s, uh, along with the uh, movement towards more recognition of humankind's influence on the environment. And uh, as a result of systems theory and systems theoretical thinking, um, and an extension of biological uh, metaphors and approaches to complex systems, in particular ecosystems, of course. And of course, there have been approaches towards studying uh, the connections between ecology and economics, most prominently with Herman Daly and subsequent authors' approaches to what's called ecological economics. And I follow a bit of a different path as uh, that one, uh, which um, in my view, uh, and according to other views as well who are in accordance or in accordance with my own uh, seeks to sort of um, find um, common ground between ecology and economics and uh, finding categories that uh, can uh, comport with both disciplines so you have things like ecological services within that uh, domain and similar concepts whereas the approach that i'm uh, in favor of and which uh, other authors that I will recount and discuss in uh, the next few videos uh, suggest a more synthetic approach that instead of re remaining separate, both ecological and economic approaches need to come together. And um, actually what we're describing are in many cases very similar um, relationships between stocks and flows and complex interactions. So there's lots to be said there. And of course, this is an owl here, which could be the owl of Minerva. And the question, of course, that Hegel asks is if the owl of Minerva flies at midnight or if uh, speculation is always after the fact. And I think that an ecological approach can allow much more and facilitate much more direct planning and integration of social goals into policy making. So the owl can fly much earlier during the day, perhaps even. So to begin with, I want to look at concepts like markets and macro phenomena. Um, one of the important lessons of the preceding uh, lectures has been that context matters and um, the ontological individualism and its methodological approach uh, of the neoclassical uh, Walrasian worldview not only disembeds but also decontextualizes social behavior uh, so, uh, and so rests on a rather what uh, I think it was Catherine Pistor called primitive utilitarianism. Context matters as we've seen both for agency and for interpreting it and uh, communication. One important such phenomena uh, for the present discussion is the market. When studying systems, one generally has to decide which elements of such phenomena one is interpreting and uh, as being exogenous and which are endogenous to the system. Uh, so from an ecological uh, point of view, as I do advocate, uh, much of what is considered exogenous in traditional economic reasoning can be or is in practice endogenized. So for instance, as Flickstein, a, an economic sociologist points out, Competition and technological change are themselves defined by market actors and governments over time. These forces are not exogenous to market society, but endogenous to these social relations. Um, of course, to remind uh, viewers and listeners that the technological change model or the growth model of Solo and Swan uh, sees technological change as something that is exogenous and just given 
Thus, it is the, the level of analysis and they're in the context that determines whether certain elements are to be taken as given or can themselves be considered variable parameters. And this observation applies as well to phenomena like profit and other regulative elements of the market as well as to contract and other coordinating elements. Uh, the view that I do advocate uh, for here will attempt to take the lessons learned in preceding lectures and to synthesize these with uh, what I call, or following Greg Dow, the imperfection principle um, that I do outline in a moment. So the greater goal at present will be to lay out a relational economics vision for a cooperative ecology as macroeconomy. So just to make the distinction between uh, what is called market forces in the literature and what is called market transactions, uh, Pat Devine argues against the juxtaposition of market and hierarchy, again, in a similar uh, argument as that that uh, Dow makes, as well as Bighetto, as well as a number of other criti critiques of uh, new institutional economics, Oliver Williamson's transaction cost economics, and other such approaches. Um, responding to Nove's question, who himself suggests, quote, there are horizontal links the market, there are vertical links, hierarchy, what other dimension is there? Uh, Devine responds that although there is no other dimension, vertical links do not have to be authoritarian and horizontal links do not have to be market-based. And in a passage recalling Eleanor Ostrom's appraisal of the standard view as a skilla and charybdis of market and state, Devine continues that the two standard models of how this coordination of production can be achieved are the model, uh, excuse me, the model of administrative command planning and the model of invisible hand or market forces. In command planning, the center in principle works everything out in advance and issues instructions to each enterprise such that between them, they produce the aggregate output required. Coordination takes place ex ante. In a market economy, each enterprise decides separately to produce what it expects to be able to sell at a profit. Relatively profitable industries attract enterprises until the additional supply causes profitability to fall. Relatively unprofitable industries lose enterprises until the reduced supply causes profit profitability to rise again. Coordination takes place ex post, in other words, in the market environment. Devine makes a distinction between market transactions and market forces that I would like to presently emphasize. Market exchange, the sale and purchase of commodities, does not imply the operation of market forces in which production and investment decisions are made atomistically and coordinated ex post. The use customers make of their purchasing power in choosing between the output of different production units generates information that is relevant to investment decisions. The way in which that information is used, however, will depend on the economic system. It may well be used by each individual enterprise separately to decide to reduce or expand its own production in ignorance of what other enterprises are doing. It may, in theory, be used by a command planner to change the uh, instructions issued to each um, enterprise involved. It may alternatively be part of the information available to production units and their negotiated coordination bodies, uh, which I do describe uh, later in this video. Uh, and um, when making decisions about production and investment. Therefore, for Devine, the argument is not that only market forces can generate information about consumer or user preferences, um, that this argument is based on a confusion of market forces with market exchange. So an example that a friend of mine um, made uh, to make this distinction is, of course, uh, buying a surgery. So in her case, she had a uh, a knee, a, a, I think it was that her knee was replaced, she had a replacement knee. And in fact, she, one can say, purchased or her insurance purchased the knee for her and the doctor installed it. Uh, and however, this market um, uh, exchange is not, in this case, dictated by market forces as the supply of pro, uh, uh, prosthetic knees is not given uh, over to the dictates of supply and demand, but instead is allocated according to what the national health services or uh, public health dictates. 
So again, there are negotiations that occur between service providers to your doctors, their ho uh, employers, hospitals. Uh, also, you have governments and or insurance companies that are involved. And so again, it is not market forces, but certain negotiating uh, techniques that are then employed to determine how much uh, my friend paid in, in the end for her knee. And this can be juxtaposed with, say, uh, buying a used car, where, of course, there's a certain supply of used cars. Uh, and, you know, this is determined by the prices are then determined by market forces, which can be supplemented by certain uh, institutions like the Blue Book that you see in the United States, which uh, recommends certain prices for used cars. So uh, to continue with the imperfection principle, The uh, next order of business, I suppose, is to establish a context of justification in the language of Karl Popper for such uh, an endeavor as describing these uh, ecological processes. This involves underlining an epistemic standpoint that challenges the assumption that perfectly competitive markets are a sufficient basis for economic analysis. In fact, as Anwar Sheikh in his uh, mag magnum opus has suggested, the assumptions of perfectly competitive markets are unrealistic and require irrational expectations. To emphasize the great chasm between the theory of com uh, complete markets and the reality of firm and household behavior in the market, Greg Dow has shown that uh, in the environment of complete and competitive markets, control rights can in fact be assigned to any set of input suppliers or output demanders, such as customers, without endangering allocative efficiency. In fact, the uh, labor-managed firm, as he has argued, exhibits the behavioral and efficiency properties of the wall-raising firm. Thus, any theory claiming to explain the empirical asymmetries between, for him, capital-managed firms or investor-owned firms and, say, cooperatives or other types of firms, democratic firms, must specify one or more departures from the framework of complete and competitive markets. If it is the case that firms are not price takers, entry is not free and sunk costs are not irrelevant, for instance, or scale economies and working capital matter, then this circumstance surely has a role to play in the rarity of things like cooperatives in most contemporary economies. Therefore, the task facing both advocates and skeptics of workers' control is to identify market failures that differently affect labor-managed and capital-managed firms, argues uh, Dow. This principle disconnects us from any last vestiges uh, of the neoclassical model, of course, just to remind listeners and viewers that this is the third uh, context of justification here with the third element of this module. I've, of course, introduced the asymmetry and replication principles in prior sets of videos describing uh, the notion of hierarchy and the notion of uh, firms um, for management as, as distinctions in between uh, this approach that we're outlining and the standard neoclassical approach. Um, so we have, again, disconnected ourselves from any last vestiges of the neoclassical model in our efforts to construct a cooperative economics. As we'll learn uh, at present, much more effect, uh, effective in analyzing really existing cooperative enterprises and for developing useful theories for entrepreneurship, innovation, and in particular, in order to devise suitable macroscopic theories of cooperation resting on the basis of the final two cooperative principles, which I've saved, of course, for this uh, discussion, an ecological framework appears more suitable. This framework is compatible with the relational economics that I have advocated for in uh, module two, as well as being compatible with the notion of the moral economy uh, of labor and the civic economy of provision that I've also alluded to um, accordingly from uh, individuals like Karl Polanyi, uh, Sam Bowles, um, Marvin Brown, and others. Next, I would like to discuss the notion of negotiated coordination, which I've also uh, mentioned uh, in, in describing Pat Devine's distinction between market forces and market transactions. And Devine suggests the name negotiated coordination, in fact, for any non-dictatorial decentralized uh, network of relationships of interdependence. 
as opposed to the information overload of a command central planned economy and the information anemia of market mechanisms. Negotiated coordination, says Devine, by contrast, allows decentralized decision making that is able to take account of all information available and arrive at a coordinated aggregate response that reflects the interests of all of those affected. The process works by operating by different logics at different levels. And again, this is a distinction to the neoclassical model, which attempts to rediscover the micro uh, level at each uh, subsequent level. And again, getting to the macro level, we then have a representative agent or an aggregate of all like-minded utility maximizing homo economicus. And that, of course, gets us into many dangers. So in Pat's Devine's view, the, at the level of the organization, so the individual firm or even the individual plant, Production units are responsible for their day-to-day -day activities, for the use they make of their existing capacity. They set prices equal to long-run costs calculated on the basis of socially determined primary input prices and their prevailing level of productivity. The principal responsibility of production units is to use their existing capacity to meet customer demand. So it sounds rather elementary. As and, so, and accordingly, as firms are in the best position to determine their local capacities and estimate their ability to meet demand, it is actually socially beneficial to make such decisions at the organizational level. As Devine concludes, since the pattern of consumer and user demand is the quantitative reflection of collectively and individually determined priorities, meeting it represents a first approximation to the way in which existing capacity can best be used in the social interest. And there we have the notion of existing capacity. So that's where we start to distinguish at different levels. And again, moving up a level decisions regarding investment, and that's exactly what affects um, existing capacity, should be made out, outside of individual firms. Such decisions would be carried out by what Devine calls negotiated coordination bodies, which I've already mentioned above. Uh, for and uh, which uh, Devine describes in the following way. The composition of negotiated coordination bodies would be determined by applying the basic principle of self-government, representation of all affected interests, and would therefore vary according to the characteristics of the activity involved. So uh, depending on the sector or the industry involved. Thus, negotiated coordination bodies, says Devine, for nationally organized activities would be made up of representatives of the following. All the production units in the branch of production, the national negotiated coordination bodies for major supplying and major user branches, government and functional user bodies, and national consumers organizations, the sections of the National Planning Commission concerned with sector coordination, major new investment and regional distribution, the relevant regional planning commissions and the relevant national level interest and cause groups, including, of course, the trade unions. Therefore, negotiated coordination bodies, as uh, Devine uh, abbreviates them NCBs, do not refer to any discrete phenomena, but depend on the industry or sector in question and are organized along the typology of consensus and the logic of discourse. Delegating investment decisions to the higher level NCBs enables investment decisions to be coordinated ex ante in the light of all relevant information. This to some quite radical judgment is made on the basis that the quantitative information privy to individual organizations isn't sufficient to make long-term investment decisions that affect not only the firm's stakeholders, but also the general community. So just as one farmer uh, uh, irrigating or taking from the groundwater or using certain chemical pesticides, of course, impacts his neighbors, the community around him and the groundwater below him. Uh, firms' investment decisions also impact the ecosystem in which they exist. And of course, taking these things uh, as atomistically organized renders certain decisions uh, redundant or uh, not effective. At the same time, organizational actions to reduce interconnectedness at the present moment may in the long run increase the interdependence amongst environmental elements. It is easy to see the relation of this complex of perspectives related, how it relates to the notion of negotiated coordination advanced by Devine. In particular, 
I argue that the main common denominator entails the observation that the trade-off that increased unpredictability on the one hand and increased system vulnerability on the other have can best be circumnavigated via active stakeholder dialogue and a view to long-term relational contracts, including informal contracts. Uh, so there is a relation between the fact that uh, organizations today are working in a, an unpredictable and indeterminate situation and the vulnerability that the, which this exposes them, that ergo uh, suggests, while it does not require, uh, an increasing level of coordination amongst various stakeholders, including those within the firm. So this perspective, along with the perspective that I've described in prior videos following Jeffrey Pfeffer, that of resource dependency, think about this notion of co-optation that we discussed with reference to the feminist group at the university, uh, they, these perspectives appeared to desire overcoming the apparent dilemma between market and or government coordination by seeking a third way that, uh, excuse the reference, that seeks to regulate and coordinate activities at the most effective level. Um, another parallel between the notions of ne negotiated coordination and Pfeffer's notion of resource dependence is the focus uh, of the latter on so -called, the so-called negotiated environment. According to Pfeffer, organizations continually renegotiate their environment to reduce resource dependence and to stabilize the transactions through some form of interfirm linkage. While these forms of coordination, or what Wieland would refer to as a cooperative organization, vary, they all have the advantage of being more flexible than managing dependence through ownership. Relations of established, rather, so this is things like acquisitions and merger. So relations established through communication and consensus can be established, renegotiated, and reestablished with more ease than the integration of organizations by merger uh, and acquisition can be altered. So, Pfeffer and Salomon. And there's a lot to be said there. The, the notion of vertical integration that we see so ever present in today's economy, in fact, has rendered many organizations uh, strong, one could say, and, and, and however, and resilient at the same time, they are quite vulnerable to uh, collapse. And of course, we do have this notion that has increasingly become of uh, use in recent years of too big to fail. And of course, this notion of um, consensus and a negotiated environment and negotiated coordination can reduce the likelihood of strong system shocks uh, affecting uh, such organizations in adverse ways that then ultimately have very negative impacts on the entire economy and society. Um, the last element on negotiated coordination that I wanted to uh, mention is the relationship between negotiated coordination and uncertainty. Neither Pfeffer or Pat Devine explicitly mention cooperatives or the cooperative principles as tools to realize such negotiation of the environment. But it is clear when juxtaposing this discussion with that of the uh, most recent lectures that I've uh, made, um, that uh, Devine and Pfeffer have certain uh, ideas that are commensurate with these uh, principles and that the cooperative principles are very well equipped to coordinate such multi-level act uh, activity. They appear to serve at the same time as coordinate, coordinating tools and as criteria of organizational efficacy. To return to the language of Immanuel Kant from the prior module too, we can refer to them as intersubjective logics they also act in a manner related to Alman's coordinated equilibrium, signaling like-mindedness to others in the network. All of these attributes are uncertainty reducing. As opposed to standard exchange contracts, they appear to serve as relational contracts which extend to general categories of behavior and activities. Thus, similarly to, uh, as, Granovet, as Mark Granovetter discusses, loose networks of long-term repeated interactions between organizations are not regulated in the first instance by contract, but by a moral economy, that is status, reputation, norms, 
These all play roles in guiding business relations among suppliers of intermediary components to their industrial clients, for instance. Uh, think of the Saibatsu in Japan or the large uh, supply networks that you have in the south of Germany for auto suppliers like Daimler. Thus, focusing on uh, modeling and analyzing social or public action on such loose networks of reciprocal relations would be something negotiated coordination could facilitate. This relational contract aspect of negotiated coordination is clearly also uncertainty reducing in the same manner as meteorologists provide general bands uh, by which to estimate the risks that weather patterns pose to particular regions. Moving on, the next concept I wish to introduce beyond uh, negotiated coordination, and before we get into the actual analysis of the last two cooperative principles, you have to keep something for suspense reasons, you know, uh, and um, is process ecology. And this is a fascinating concept that was introduced by Robert Ulanovic in some of his work attempting to form some uh, extensive research foundations for complex systems, in particular human systems, um, and their interdependence and interrelationships. So the idea is that as societies and institutions evolve, both social and individual, public and private needs change. And as society in general changes, and especially as more complex and interdependent societies like the current global community change, their institutions necessarily also change, adapt, and maintain certain characteristics they possessed previously. Part of this involves institutional values. Uh, one macro culture, for instance, is replaced with another modified culture. There is often a question of which culture provides the better, better footing for meeting long term, uh, both long term and shorter term interests. Given the fact that limited foresight and the general indeterminacy of future events, it is sometimes hard to find a suitable criteria on the basis of which to collectively or individually choose among different options for coordinating activities. Thus, the notion of process ecology can actually help here. In a nutshell, it is an attempt to trace out an alternative vision for the analysis of complex systems based on uh, what uh, Ulanovic has called uh, a shift from the Eliadic to the Milesian way of thought. The former, the Eliadic, is associated with Plato, who was concerned with forms and essences even beyond time and space. So human beings are a shadow or a, uh, a, a bad representation of the ideal of what humanity could be. A saucer or a cup is a bad copy of what an ideal cup or saucer could be. Justice, as we experience it, is a bad copy of uh, the, what re the ideal of justice should be, and so on and so forth. While the latter, the Milesian school of thought, is associated with the uh, pre-Socratic uh, philosopher Heraclitus, whose perspective is best represented by the famous quote, all is flux. Or similarly by the adage that one never steps into the same river twice. Many, including Karl Popper, have traced out the tradition of skepticism from Heraclitus's view that uh, lo logical orders, lo logos orders phenomena like the strings of a, on a lyre. Similarly, Alfred North Whitehead's process philosophy is an extension, of, arguably, of the Milesian focus on process instead of laws. And I should remind listeners and viewers of the notion that Whitehead popularized uh, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. So oftentimes we are actually talking about a process when we describe something as having law-like properties. In the interest of adequately describing macrocultures and macro processes, Ulanovic offers a view couched in what is referred to as an ecosystems metaphysic which attempts to move away from dealing with natural laws and focuses instead on configurations of processes. This is achieved by means of a phenomenological approach to thermodynamics and a physical description of system level flows. 
Now, what does this mean? Ulanovich suggests that it is often enough to study system level flows, that is these aggregate phenomena or emergent phenomena, I should rather say, in, uh, in order to gain a deep understanding of causal processes at a macroscopic level. However, he argues that much of modern science, even social science, was built up on uh, or reconstructed from deterministic foundations uh, of, mod of mechanical causality, which forgets that there are in innumerable examples of systems of equations such as those describing the many-body problem that appear to be deterministic, but in reality they give rise to behavior that cannot be distinguished from chaos. Again, the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Um, uh, of course, the problem is also one of reductionism, and uh, this describes much of modern scientific activity. Um, this blind spot in many of the life sciences for macroscopic phenomena leads to an overemphasis on atomistic or molecular analysis. This detracts from a pragmatic understanding of cause and effect, as what is at issue is the magnitude of the effect that any single causal factor may have in the realm of natural phenomena. Moreover, within this micro foundations camp, again, this reductionist camp that seeks to describe even complex phenomena by reducing it to its most uh, uh, singular or simplistic elements, there is often a lack of coherence on core principles, says Ivanovitz. It is as much by default as by any causal ties that higher level phenomena are still usually referenced back to biomolecular events. However, such efforts are still usually referenced to, uh, excuse me, however, such efforts are frequently unnecessary and also on occasion harmful to the generation of new knowledge. Uh, Ulanovich describes the term autocata autocatalysis, which I do return to uh, in the following, as such a phenomenon where in fact causation occurs on a higher order than the individual components of the autocatalytic chain. Thus, contingencies that facilitate any co component process will be rewarded, whereas those that interfere with the facilitation anywhere will be decremented. So this notion of autocatalysis again creates vortexes of self-reinforcing uh, processes, one can say. And thus process ecology can actually help navigate the context of justification that I have outlined uh, with the notion of negotiated coordination and this imperfection uh, principle. And in so doing, facilitate a systematization of thinking regarding the cooperative organization. Uh, the next concept in process uh, ecology is the notion of the aleatoric. And I actually think I will begin to describe it in the next video. So, see you there.